So, um, just let you have a talk a bit about what Orion do for those who don't know. Sure, just, just, a, just a couple of slides. So, Orion, we very much describe ourselves as a full service online learning partner. So, the core of our business is working with people to create custom content. And we do also do a lot in supporting internal content authoring teams, maybe take what they're doing to, to the next level um, through, our, through our capacity building. And we deploy a number of learning management system options. Um, really, it's about looking at particular problems of an organization and just giving it advice. So our webinars support that, trying to share knowledge, trying to give people ideas. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of follow-ups, and, and we'll certainly certainly help people, whether it's just uh, resources or you want to find out a bit more about what we do. In terms of who we uh, do that for, it's just a, a small reflection of our clients. We do work across uh, all sectors. Um, very different challenges, which is the exciting bit. And uh, I think one of the big things is just everybody has something to teach. So that's, that's, the, end of the, that's the end of the plug, and we'll get straight to what we're, what we're talking about today. I say almost the end of the plug, John. But uh, we did just recently win a, win a Gold Brandon Hall Award uh, for, for Best Learning Team. Uh, and John would be, be a core part of our, our team here at Orient. Yeah, so I think Kevin squeezed a few more uh, uh, um, plug slides in there. Um, so here's my, so Gavin has finished his sales pitch, so this is my brief sales pitch for the ELM. So if you're not an ELM member, I really, really strongly encourage you to think about, about uh, joining the community. It is a community for people involved in e-learning. Um, our, our, we aim to get people up to speed in e-learning, the approaches to e-learning. Really so the sort of things we're covering today are really you know, bread and butter stuff to the ELM. We just had our successful conference in London last, last, last week. Uh, you'll find us on e-learningnetwork.org. Uh, I'm also a judge on the e-learning awards. So uh, this year's e-learning awards will be uh, awarded at uh, the big gala dinner in London at the end, the end of November. Those of you who are who have entered who are on short lists, uh, good, good luck to you all. So enough of the, uh, the sales pictures. So now we'll talk about sort of 10, 10 key trends for 2017. We do this every year, and obviously it's, it's tr tricky to find 10 new ones each year. So hopefully what we're doing is sort of some of them we, we bring over the next year and we add a bit to them, and some are, are genuinely, genuinely new. Uh, this is a fairly subjective view of what I think the, I think the, 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 the key, key trends are. Uh, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, they will be of enormous value to you. I'm a very pragmatic practical person, so I also like to look at, uh, at uh, uh, you know, how they might affect what uh, uh, building is you then. So we're going to look at micro-learning, something I think you may have heard of, uh, uh, certainly going to be more popular in 2017. Uh, we're going to look at games and education, which is you know, still, still on the operate, operate path. Uh, we're going to look at response to authoring, authoring tools. Uh, also look at the uh, interactive video. So I give John a headset here to make this other people maybe just start going on the audio as well. So, in fact, today we're also going to be looking at uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, we're going to look at uh, brain-friendly design of e-learning. Looking at adaptive and personalized learning. We're going to look at the learning experience design. Uh, we're also going to take a, a look at, uh, this is hot off the press, uh, Articulate 360, the, the, the latest release from, from Articulus. And finally, a brief look at uh, learning analytics. So the green ones are effectively sort of categorized as design trends. So they're there to do with the way we go about designing, designing learning. The blue ones are more to do with, 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 with tech trends. Uh, some com I use a combination of both. And the other thing I want to look at as I go through is affordability. In other words, uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we should be doing this, but actually, you know, is it, is it, is it uh, realistic and practical and do we have budgets for it? So we have to be applying a sort of very brief affordability test um, as, we, as we move through each of those, of those trends. So hopefully everybody is now hearing me a bit more clearly. We move to a different, different mic. Seems to be a little bit better. I'm just passing that question. Good. Okay. So, so first, first of all, we have our 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 uh, quick uh, question for you. Um, so we'd like to ask you know how you currently deliver learning online. Okay. So we're just going to launch launch a poll. We're just going to launch a, a poll for this. We'll give you a few a few seconds to respond. Um, so the the question is how do you currently deliver learning online? Um, 
either we haven't started, we're reviewing our options. We build some courses internally. Uh, we even source two development partners, or uh, it's a combination. You know, it depends on the on the project. So four options. You can pick on them. I can see responses coming in now. So we'll give you about uh, 10, 20 seconds. You should be able to access the poll in a good webinar uh, option. Pick, pick your, your desired choice, and then we'll review that together. Good, okay. That's good. Okay, in terms of our, our responses then, as you can see on the screen, 26% uh, builds of courses internally. No, nobody's, nobody's not started, so no newbies. I don't know what we talk about, uh, what we talk about today. I'm going to ask a, a follow-up question uh, for this. Uh, the follow-up question is really about, you know, you know, it's a bit of a journey. So how do you feel about your, your progress to date? So maybe get you answer this. So how do you feel about your progress to date? Uh, I've, I've put in some things that maybe you would hear going out and, and speaking to different people. So we, we don't know what we don't know. We're happy with our progress. We need to operate in certain areas. We're too busy to stop and reflect. It's probably something I hear quite a lot. Um, we're, we're open to to new ideas. And I say we'll give you we'll give you about a few seconds to respond to that. You're actually you're very you're very quick bunch of webinars. Normally it takes longer than this for the percentage of responses to build up. But, uh, okay, and I'll stop that there and I'll, I'll share that. Okay, so twenty percent we don't know what we don't know. Uh, we need upper game in certain areas. Uh, maybe we can get into, if you want to comment what those areas are in, in the questions, we'll, we'll, we'll field that into our chat later on. We're too busy to stop and reflect. Glad to see you're not, you're not too busy to join us. You might be doing something else in the background. Uh, and then 60% open to new ideas. We did allow multiple answers on, on that. Great, Great, good. It's good to see um, a focus on new ideas and opting our game. I think hopefully this, this uh, webinar will, will We'll time it up quite, quite, quite nicely. nicely. So we're going to start off with uh, Trevor Lund, which is uh, micro-learning. I'm classifying this as a design trend, because I think uh, everybody can do micro-learning with whatever tools they, they've got. And I've given them an affordability of one pound sign, so actually it's too expensive to, to do micro-learning. Uh, but it does need some, some thought. So, so what is micro-learning? Well, the reason we think micro-learning is coming in is people are uh, have a less attention span, according, according to some latest statistics I read. Uh, teenagers have less, less less attention span than the gold base. I'm not sure that I believe that, but uh, but certainly in the in this modern inform, information rich world, with our attention span is getting less and less. And uh, we're also time poor, so we're very very busy people. Could be taking some time out to attend this webinar, but also but also you know there's more and more pressures on 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 our time. Also there's flexibility. So what we want to do is to, is to access learning more closer to the point of need when we need it. Uh, rather than do a five day course, we want to be able to access learning. Yeah, at, at, at that, that point, point of need. And, and the final thing, thing is actually ties in nicely to a trend we'll look at later on is brain training. So the thing the short short chunks is, is, is much, much more, more much much better for our for the helping us learn. So I have this idea that uh, one thing I think we tend to do in e-learning, we tend to pack everything into one score module. So uh, micro-learning sort of goes against this. What we do with micro-learning is all packing. So we all pack. Instead of putting videos and scenarios and PDFs and, and exercises and quizzes into an e-learning module, uh, we all pack them as a series of separate, of separate uh, learning activities. Uh, and so generally the rule seems to be less than five minutes. Uh, one learning, learning outcome per activity. And then link by some sort of pathway. So it's no good just, just, a, just a scattered, scattered approach, but they need to be linked, be linked in, uh, to form some, some sort of coherent that learning journey. Okay, okay so, so the uh, second trend is uh, brain friendly. So there's a lot more research coming out these days uh, from cognitive science about how the brain works and specifically how, how we learn. So I'll pass this as a, as a design trend. I spoke about this at the uh, conference. And the affordability is, uh, is low here, but it actually it's just a, an approach to the way you design your, your, your learning. And this is a slide I've a lot of presentations and 
talks I, I give, a lot of my clients really believe learning it like this, you feed it all into the machine, uh, and every, every, every single word, every single, thing, every single image goes straight into the learner's head. Sadly, uh, this isn't the way, this isn't the way the brain or learners work. And a lot of this is fueled by all the different theories, so there's, a, there's a whole raft of different learning theories. Let's have brains. Uh, and actually, uh, the way we the way we take information, learning anything on board is through our five senses, primarily through our through our visual, also also audio, as you're probably doing in this in this in this webinar, uh, and all that goes into our short term or working memory. And what I've tried to show in this image here is that our short term working memory is very very small. So it's actually quite a challenge getting stuff from that short term working memory into our long term memory. So there's a little bit, there's a little bit of a, 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 my diagram of how the uh, how the thinking works. So from our senses, uh, we pay attention. So we can decide not to pay attention to things. You can either look at my slides and or listen to me, or you can do both or neither. Uh, anybody who's doing an email out there, that includes you. Um, but things go into our working memory, and then they don't stay there very, very long at all. In fact, what happens with most things in our working memory, it goes straight out again. It's a bit like a, a bucket with lots of holes in it. It's only when we pay attention to something and, uh, and, uh, and uh, do something uh, that we actually encode something into our long-term memory. And we want people to learn. We have to uh, ensure that they are doing this in, in, in encoding. The only thing we can do as learning designers to help that encoding uh, will Im improve the learning outcome. So um, I, I, there's a whole 30-minute talk I do, I do on this, but there's, uh, we picked up some of the key uh, results and research from from a number of these different people, particularly Daniel Willingham, who's done a lot of work as a corporate scientist, done a lot of work on how learning how, how learning works. Uh, another book called How We Learn by Benedict Carey, uh, and Back to the UK by our own Stella Collins. Uh, so these are three books I definitely recommend if you're a learning designer. Uh, some really interesting stuff there about 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 uh, uh, improving learning designs to make them more brain friendly. Okay, trend three, uh, one we covered again, covered last year, uh, but we definitely want to cover again because it's becoming more and more popular. So responsive de de um, design. So the idea that, that we produce content that works across all, all devices, not just one, not just our laptop or, 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 or desktop. So are increasingly, and I probably like most of you, clients are increasingly ask, asking for content that plays well on all devices. Uh, and uh, the only way to really do this effectively is to use some sort of responsive design approach. So I have a little, another question for you here. Okay, so the whole on screen. What devices will your learners use to access your digital courses? So we select all that apply. The, the computer on their desk where they work, the laptop that is supplied by our organization, uh, tablet that we provide for our staff, smartphone that we provide for our staff, the laptop, tablet, or smartphone that our staff will for themselves. Okay, so we'll give you a few more seconds. Once again, your fingers on <laughs> fingers on buzzers are you're, you're pretty pretty quick. Uh, obviously no, no novices here with, with, with webinar. Um, okay, 88% John saying the computer on their desk, I'll just put this up and I'll, I'll share it. 88% saying the computer on their desk where they work, 62% uh, laptop, 31 tablet, 19 smartphone, so maybe not, not quite as prevalent, um, and 65% saying the devices that staff will put in themselves. Great, I think that's really interesting. So I think clearly most e-learning probably in most organizations is still done on laptops and desktops, but increasingly the alternative is the uh, is the is the is the smartphone and specifically a smartphone that that the that the, uh, the employee owns themselves. So they want to be bring your own 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 device approach. Um, clearly, responsive design is really a, a, a solution to primarily the mobile challenge. So e-learning that needs to work on a mobile. Probably responsive is the only approach you can take. We can design e-learning on something like Storyline. Uh, it will work fine on, on a tablet, but it just will not work on, 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 a, on a phone. And it's driven, obviously, primarily by this desire to move to mobile devices, but more challengingly recently by, by the death of Flash. So, so at the end of this year, Chrome, for example, is the browser will no longer support Flash. So a lot of clients, our clients, are running around saying, well, what do we do with all our 
our, our flash content. So I think it's 27, 17 and beyond, uh, increasingly, uh, um, Elon producing flash simply won't, won't, won't run. So what are our options in 2017? Well, we do still have the slide-based approach, so those of you out there are using our articulate storyline, uh, uh, you can still use that, uh, but basically you'll publish in future at latest in R5, and in fact the latest version, as we'll talk about later, the latest version of articulate uh, starts with an HTML5 first, flash second approach, unlike it is now where it's the other way around. Uh, but then the other, probably the other more, more, more popular approach these days, especially if you want to design for mobile phone, is responsive design using HTML5, where the content uh, 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 you know, resizes depending on, on, on the screen you have. So tools like, uh, for example, Evolve, which uses the ADAPT framework. So my message to everybody is do not rely on Flash in 2017. So the whole load of responsive authoring tools, tools out there, Evolve we've already mentioned, uses, uh, uses Adapt, uh, Lucidat uses its own proprietary uh, approach, uh, as does Gomo and, and Respond 5 and Shift. Uh, that we put in here now, hot off the press, the new responsive design tool from, from Articulate. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. So, trend four, interactive video. So um, I'm a big fan of, uh, I think video is very, very popular for, for, for on, on the web these days. Lots of these courses now, MOOCs and stuff, just use video with no interaction, interaction at all, which is a shame because as a learn designer, I think that takes away a lot of the value of, of, of interacting with our learners. So the idea that we can add a sort of interact, interactive layer to video is really, really powerful. Uh, on the affordability test, it's a bit, going to be a bit more expensive, different platforms we have to use, and some of those platforms are are slightly, slightly more, more, more expensive. So, another question to, 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 sit, to set you guys. Yeah, you might have messed up on that one. Maybe somebody could put some comments in, in the question. Uh, it's your trigger finger, so I've lost that close it. But if the question is, if, if you had to learn uh, to use the responsive offering tool, which are the approaches you can use to get help to get you up to up to speed. So maybe you want to put that in the questions. Either buy a buy a book, responsive design for absolute dummies. <laughs> uh, option two is watch whatever videos I can on YouTube when it's up. Uh, option three is take the online course rapid start in responsive design. So if you want if you want to comment on options one, two, or three um, in, in the in the question tab. So if you have to learn to use a new responsive offering tool, which of these approaches would you choose to help get up to speed? Option one, buy a book, responsive design for absolute dummies. Option two, watch whatever videos that you can on YouTube when stuff. And option three, take the online course rapid start in responsive design. <laughs> somebody said ask somebody else to do it. <laughs> That's a very good, good response. Okay. Uh, probably more people saying option three, John. Um, yeah, for, for Alan, I said can't see the options because I managed to launch and close the, the, the poll with a double click. So, um, so option one was our, our book to dummies. Uh, option three was our was our full blown course. Option two was more of a just in time and you check the videos. Uh, somebody saying Charles saying online documentation plus trial trial and error. Um, so uh, Alistair saying learn online. Uh, online courses include video, says so, so Julie. Um, we'll, we'll say option three, John. People are looking for a more formal, a formal course. Well, it's great, great to hear it, actually. Uh, yes, I mean, I expect that probably video would be a very popular option uh, at, right at the start, but of course, anybody who chose, chooses a course works works for me as a learning designer. Uh, yes, uh, choosing the online help, not so, not so keen, not so sure I get the right answer there. I used to develop online help systems, and, uh, and uh, they used to leave way more out than they, that they include. Okay, thanks for that. So, uh, video, interactive video, well, I think a couple, couple of years ago, the, uh, this, this uh, product um, called um, uh, lifesaver about how to do uh, um, how to um, a first aid sort of a, a, a learning um, module um, was developed and won a lot of took took a little load of e-learning e awards. That, that's available. It's free. You can download it. It's an app. 
and I think it's a really powerful example of, 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 of interactivity. Uh, as far as affordability goes, it probably is quite expensive to, to, to develop. But hey, there are a whole load of uh, new tools coming along. So here's a good example uh, using one of the tools. It's called a tool called Wrap Media. And this is a, a really nice example of a much, much simpler, straightforward, bit of video, ask a few questions, give some feedback, carry on with the video. So quite, you know, quite a straightforward approach, but, but much, much more engaging than simply watching watching a video. And there are a number of tools out there that, that are now letting uh, you know, the average person build some, some, some cool interactive videos. Uh, this example is from, from Rap Media. Uh, there's also a thing called H5P, which is an open source uh, approach. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, uh, it's, 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 uh, all of these three products are, are free trials, and it's worth giving them a, a, bit of a, bit of a, a bit of a test drive. Also, if you have Storyline, uh, you may, have, may, have, may, have, may have seen some, some examples. So you can develop, effectively, an uh, interactive video using Storyline. So you're putting a video in the background, uh, and then using uh, various triggers to pause the, the video, and then presenting uh, a question giving some feedback and actually uh, it, it works actually really really well in, in Storyline. Of course it won't work place well on your mobile phone uh, but, but definitely those who are using desktop and laptop approaches it's something that is definitely worth having a, an experiment with. So the trend five, games and gamification. I know some people are fed up with hearing about games and gamification but I think I think uh, it, it's, a, it's proving a very successful approach when it comes especially to, 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 to behavior change. Uh, classified as a design trend, it's it's probably slightly less affordable. It needs a more complex approach to the learning design, uh, and probably uh, more more some more expensive tools and, and, and things like illustrations, in, uh, for example, are much more important in, in, in games and gamification. Um, so I'd just like to um, some of the people ask me, you know, is it a game or is it gamification? And people get confused with interpreters. Well, gamification is effectively adding game-like elements, things things like points badges, levels, challenges to existing content or to other real-world activities. So the example on the right is, uh, is RunKeeper, that's a, an app for your phone, a fitness app. So it encourages, encourages you to do something every day, tracks your progress. So that, that's pure gamification. At the other end of the scale, we have, uh, we have full, full games, such as Grand Theft Auto. And there's a whole raft of different things in the middle. So things which are, are more game-like than gamification-like. And other things which are more game pace like but less less game like. I can just chip in there, John. I absolutely agree with that. I think I think one of the things when we're speaking about people, there, there's a fear that maybe a game can be a flippant learning experience. But it, as you say there, John, game style elements. So we're, we're doing a project at the moment where we're really thinking quite carefully about the audio, you know, the iconography, the navigation of something, trying to reflect. Uh, it, it's actually for part of the armed services trying to reflect a game style approach. But it's, it's definitely a very serious learning experience. It's, it's definitely not a flippant game. Yes, I think so. I think, you know, as we understand more about games and game patient, then we can actually play around with, 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 with you know, what makes, makes the, both of those approaches successful. So I'm just going to put you to, uh, to the test now. So I'm going to give some examples, some of the screenshots, but I want you to tell me whether you think they are game or Gamification. So if you just want to type into the chat box whether it's game or gamification. So press one up, press one, game or gamification. And saying game, let me see. We've got five, six, six gamifications so far. A couple saying game. I'm not influencing the responses. I think. Good, good. Okay. Well, actually, actually this is this is simple gamification. So all it is is a is a menu or a storyline module. Uh, uh, no game at all, but it looks sort of game-like, doesn't it? Uh, this one, game or gamification? A little bit more divided on that one, John. Yes, that's good. It is actually a game. Uh, it uses a standard sort of role-playing adventure type type game to take people to customer service skills. Uh, this one, game or gamification?
This well, is. Doesn't that give you selections? Probably too close to call. So. Okay, this is also gamification. So, so actually, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, sort of idea of setting up a number of e learning modules. There's some challenges, and there are some points. Uh, but but actually, uh, there's there's not a lot of game going on in, in this. But it does look like a game. Uh, this one, game or gamification, probably a slightly easier. Yeah. Exactly, game. It's a game. It's a proper game. Um, well, not the world, not the best game I've seen in the world. It's, it's about hygiene in in uh, uh, in in, uh, in uh, um, food preparation, um, and uh, yeah, I struggle with some of the learning outcomes, but it is definitely a game. This one, game or gamification. Well, this one is classic gamification. It's simply uh, a quiz dressed up as, as a sort of a sort of game-like interface based on the sort of ideas of who wants to be a millionaire. Um, so yeah, there's lots of these things out there. So so they may look look fun, and, and but actually, you know, be careful using these. They 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 add one element of fun, but they're not really. They certainly, you don't don't uh, classify the game. And this you find lots of these examples on on the Articles website, for example. Uh, this one, game or game patient. I like this one's called Hotel Manager, and it's very definitely a game. Uh, this one, so using LinkedIn for business, game or game patient. Once again, this is actually game patient. Uh, it's actually built in Adobe Edge, who, uh, Edge Animate, if you've ever come, come across that, HTML5. Uh, this one, Game or Gamification. Actually, just a fairly straightforward e-learning module. It won an award a few years ago, but it is uh, probably wouldn't win an award now. And uh, once again, it is just Gamification. So it's content dressed up uh, to look more like a game. John, can we just... Can we just to labor the point, can we just recap on on that core difference? Obviously, we can tell you know tell a look and feel of some of these things. Can we just recap on that core difference. Okay, uh, as I uh, maybe my first slide implied, it, it's sometimes quite tricky on first on first on first sight to tell whether something is game or gamification. Generally, though, uh, uh, gamification it looks sort of game like, but when you start to go through it, it's more conventional type 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 e learning content. Whereas a game puts you into what we would call an immersive situation, uh, so you have, uh, so you actually feel you, you're interacting with some sort of almost as a game would have some sort of AI in it. For example, uh, most game facing has very little AI; it's, it's all hand coded, decided by 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 the design of things like badges and levels. So gamification is grafted on, whereas a game design has to start from from scratch. Uh, it, it, it can be tricky on first sight to tell which is which. Finally, this is actually an example of a game. So uh, I just want to, to go back to our previous, uh, one of our previous friends, is games are really brain friendly. Uh, so they're basically puzzles to solve, and our brains like a challenge as long as it's not too hard. Uh, our brains are good at seeing patterns in things, so going by a game is it helps you try and identify what the patterns are and work out, work out uh, 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 things for yourself. Uh, and uh, great thing about about patterns is uh, as our brains can fill in fill in the blanks. So the great thing about a game is we can, as we go through the game, we can we can we can make it harder and harder. Uh, so 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 games are really really uh, a great way to 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 learn something. Uh, so again, case and content, I mean, it, it's actually not too hard to do. So this is a really nice example from Articulate, where they've taken a sort of a scenario, they've added a story. They offered a sort of personalized learning path. You choose one role or the other role. People worked also to create both those roles. Uh, you present them with a challenge. So once again, it, this is actually just a question, but it, it's set up as a, some sort of challenge with a sort of backstory. Uh, we include some sort of progress meter to say how they're getting on, not just you know, oh, I'm doing well, I'm not doing so well. And the idea that they can get negative points as well as positive points. Uh, and finally, we give them maybe a second chance to, to do it all over again. So, so by, by no means is it a game, but it has a sort of a feel sort of game like. It feels certainly more engaging than, than, than your standard click next. 
Uh, a lot of the new tools like Evolve, for example, have game placement built in. So things like levels, challenges, uh, points uh, are all built into the, to, 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 to the, to, to, to these tools. So, so uh, if you really have a head start and you use one of those more modern tools. And the other approach is to use what we call structural game creation. So you can just go out and buy an LMS. This is some growth engineering where they've completely gamified everything in the, in the LMS. So, so here you can, you can completely fill this LMS with really boring content, but, but add the gamification at the LMS level. So, so what, what, what they're, we are now calling structural gamification, I can see a lot more of that in, in 2017. Most modern LMSs are adding some sort of element of gamification, even Moodle has badges now. So learning more, uh, two books I recommend, The Theory of Fun by, by um, R R Rafe Koster, a really great book on, on, on why games are, are great for learning, or why games are, are fun and uh, effective. And something a bit more maybe useful for LD people, uh, The Game Pace of, of Learning Instruction by Carl Kapp, who's probably one of the leading ex exponents of game pace in, in, in learning. So both really good reads. And there's also an example there. I think you're going to get the slides at the end. So some of these links you have in, in the slides at the end. Uh, there's some really good examples there on that link on 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 uh, gamification. So trend six: uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. This picture I, I spotted in my high street recently. Virtual reality headsets for 11.95. So how come we've got affordability of three pounds? Well, actually, uh, buying headsets is really cheap. Developing content for, for virtual reality is much, much, much more expensive. So first of all, I'd like to take a look at augmented reality. For me, I think this is the one that probably has more, more relevance to most of us as learning designers. It's going to be cheaper to implement, uh, um, probably. Uh, so for example, here's a good example. Volkswagen are now using augmented reality to teach their engineers about, about different models. So they use an iPad, they hold up to the car, it shows them what different, different things are. I think that's something that's an approach that can be used quite a lot for these sort of practical, technical type type, type learning. Uh, it's a really great way of combining uh, some real world uh, uh, um, a situation with some some uh, like an over, like almost like a learning overlay. Uh, probably you, uh, Google is doing a lot of work on augmented reality. So in the future, you'll walk down the street and we'll see things like this. Um, I just hope that it's not completely uh, uh, wrecked by advertising. But uh, we'll, we'll go into that now. So virtual reality um, is different in that virtual reality is, is we don't interact with the real world at all, but we basically uh, uh, completely create the, uh, uh, the, the environment for, uh, for, 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 for the learner. So uh, once again, uh, you know, a lot of uh, very valid, valid applications and things like uh, health and safety, Another application I think it's going to use a lot is things like uh, in medicine, that we actually interact with a complete virtual world. And that's where the cost comes in. So although, although it's not too expensive to buy a virtual reality headset, it is very, very expensive to develop the, the content that you've got to in, in, interact with. So, so for most of us as learning designers, I don't think we're going to be going uh, you know, too far down the VR room uh, soon. But definitely for AR, I think we, we definitely you know, will start to experiment with that in, in 2017. Uh, so you may have heard of Microsoft HoloLens, which is an augmented reality headset, uh, which pretty much does what the Volkswagen thing does, and much, much more effectively. Uh, but one of these headsets currently costs £3,000. Uh, plus, there's a whole lot of effort that needs to go into developing content for, uh, that's supported by the headset. So, so yes, great for the future. You'll hear a lot, a lot of people saying AR and VR is the, the way forward. Uh, uh, so, but ultimately, will be with very, very big budgets, but I think it's early days yet. Um, however, you can get started quite cheaply with a with a with a Google phone and Google Cardboard. So, trend seven: uh, adaptive and personalized. So, this is something really, really is a new trend, and we're going to see see see, see more of it. So, the idea: how can you how can you actually uh, personalize or adapt? Uh, learning journeys, learning pathways for, for different learners. As, as, as a learning designer, uh, you know, different learners have different needs and we often end up in e-learning designing the sort of shoot dip approach. Okay, we know we have different learners, but at the end of the day, it's much easier just to design a one size fits all. So I think uh, we're going to see increasingly, increasingly different approaches to, to adapting and personalizing, personalizing learning. 
And there are a number of different adaptive schemes. So, so one is we call uh, what we call the adaptive scheme. So we adapt to learner choices and needs uh, informed by data. So that's where we maybe uh, fast foods look at what and say, well, actually, you know, other people looked at this, but like, uh, you know, what happens when we buy something on Amazon? Uh, as a targeted approach, where we actually uh, give the learner a diagnostic and uh, present different learning activities uh, based on this. This is once again where we're going back to our micro learning from our first trend. So by breaking your e-learning module into lots of different activities, uh, we can then use the personalization and adaption to decide which activities learners uh, learn to see. And finally, scaffolding. So it's just simply doing things like signposting, uh, getting the learner to sort of help help choose what they what they think they need to do. It's another 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 uh, uh, key approach. And in practice, uh, uh, in most personalized adaptive approaches, you use a combination of all three of these approaches. Um, we had a, a talk last week at the Yelan conference from Filter, who we are developing a platform to do all this. Uh, and that's really clever about the way it uses uh, about the way it uses analytics to decide, uh, you know, what learning uh, might be useful, uh, and also to what you know, what, else, what what having done one piece of learning, what other piece of learning might you, you, you do. So trend A, learning experience design. So learning design, I guess, this is really really key. So increasingly, I think anybody who's been been involved in designing learning experiences. Uh, particularly things like uh, what we call campaign learning. So actually, there's a lot more work involved in, in looking at uh, you know, what we're trying to achieve, what, you know, what using things like storytelling, uh, looking at personas, what we want people to to the different sort of what learners, different learners expect, and then sort of the conceptualization of this and prototyping. So just really making sure we com we develop a complete experience, a learning experience, rather than a simple uh, sheet dip type type. E e-learning e module. And I think increasingly uh, we'll talk about learning experience designers rather than instruction designers, so, so designing the end-to-end -end ex experience, not just involving e-learning but also involving workplace activities, uh, uh, video, the AR, VR, combining all those things into, the, into, the, into a coherent uh, learning ex experience. Um, a really good example I think uh, that I've come across recently is uh, developed by the Open University, there's a, a link with there, which really puts you as a learner into some situations and, and really takes you to what I call a really uh, thorough learning experience. Uh, this is actually developed in, in, in Elucidac, one of the responsive tools, but actually it, it, it could have been developed in, in just one well storyline. A really good example of what I call good learning experience design. So, um, trend nine, we're getting close to the end of our ten trends. So um, learning analytics, so certainly we're hearing a lot, lot more about, about learning analytics um, and uh, what they call big data, or was a struggle with the term big data, um, um, basically lots of data, and in the past we, we uh, capture lots of data, but are able to do anything with it. I don't know if you shop at Sainsbury's or Tesco, I'm sure you do, and you give your loyalty card in for years, Sainsbury's and Tesco's, I'll be capturing data on us as shoppers, uh, but they've had so much data, they've been completely unable to do anything with it. But increasingly, we're now being able to look at that data and say, well, what does it tell us about, about, about uh, their case, shopping habits? But in our case, learners' learners' needs and requirements. What, is, what do learners really need to do? What are they doing? So just, uh, I think, our final poll question. Um, Hopefully okay. Gavin's going to um, double-click on this one. Okay, um, going very gently there with my big fingers, John. Um, <coughs> so, who currently collects data um, on how and what their employees are learning? So, your options are we don't collect any data, we only collect course completions and assessment scores, or we capture a range of data on how employees are, are accessing them. I'll give you a few seconds to respond to that. Yeah. Probably seeing John, you know, I'm reading really between the lines here, it's a reflection of maybe some of the the options or, or limitations of score. Uh, we've got 70% uh, opting for uh, collecting course completions and assessment scores. Nobody, nobody's not collecting data, so everybody is collecting some data. 30% are, are capturing the range of data. 
Yeah, yeah so I think there's, a, yeah, there's an interesting 70 30 percent split there. I mean, largely, I think that, that reflects currently what our LMSs do. Um, so um, our LMS is, is good really at, at just checking somebody's done something and then, and then whether they've passed, passed or not. But I think in future, and I think probably learning analytics is probably a little more advanced in, in, in the education space. Uh, but I suspect that, 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 that uh, in the private sector we're going to catch up quite quickly because I think it really, it on, it on, it just in some ways, learning, effective learning analytics on the pins, a lot of the other things we've talked about, things like micro learning, uh, personalized. Uh, access on different devices at different times when learning is needed. That those learning analytics will give us give us a lot more data on, on the how and why our, our employees learn. Once again, we haven't mentioned it this time, but but the Experience API, what was called TinCan, it, it, that technology is designed entirely to give us much much better learning analytics. So certainly, anybody out there who's uh, in the market to buy an LMS. Um, as well as ticking the gamification box, I think you would definitely ask some early questions about what, what the learning analytics are. So, trend number 10, our final trend, and we added this in as a, as a late, we actually I took one out last week and added this, this one in. So, our ticket 360, I think um, probably a lot of you out there, certainly you know, the vast majority of people I, I come across, uh, use Storyline. Uh, or studio to develop their, their in-house e-learning and a lot of e-learning companies use it as well. We certainly use it here at, 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 at Orion. So, so the fact that our have completely relaunched this complete suite of few tools is, is a really interesting uh, approach. So we have, um, so I don't know if you've, uh, if you've had, a, had a time to have a look at, at the, new, the new 360, but certainly it uh, has a whole new extra, extra toys into our toolkit. We still have Storyline. Uh, so these these products here, uh, Prezo, Peak, Storyline, Studio, and Replay are all downloadable. They're downloadable to 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 the desktop. But on top of that, we have uh, these cloud-based tools. Uh, probably the most significant of these is Rise, which is their responsive uh, design tool. Uh, I haven't had a chance to have a quick play with it, but certainly it seems very impressive with inline editing. Pretty straightforward to use. So so certainly those who are using our ticket, there's a whole new uh, uh, way to 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 to, to uh, Potentially to design your e-learning. Also, our ticket review is a really nice, nice solution. So that lets, lets so if you're building current modules in in Storyline, our ticket review lets you. Uh, it's a really neat uh, reviewing tool to let your uh, people to review and comment on on, on each each slide in your Storyline. And the pricing is interesting. Um, it's going to move to a to a per user per annum. Uh, approach, which which I know for, for some clients is 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 a, is a good approach, but also some clients I think will, will find that a bit of a challenge. So no longer do you just pay your one-off uh, cost and, and, and download it and use it for years. You have to then pay this uh, per each year, every year. So um, for me, uh, Storyline 360 looks a lot like Storyline 2, but what it does do, what it what it appears to primarily do. Is make it much much so, so it, it focuses much much more on the HTML5. So they have a responsive player. Uh, so so I think uh, what they certainly have done in this latest release of Storyline, it looks very very similar to to Storyline 2. If you load it up, uh, it's got a few more bells and whistles like dials. But otherwise, what they've mainly done is behind the background. So when you publish the HTML5, and the idea now that, that that it will now uh, focus on HTML5 as the core delivery. With Flash as the as the, as the fallback. Obviously, this, this is quite hot off the press, John. So it's probably would you say it's a little bit a case of, of sort of waiting to see. And I think you know, I think the thing with with tools, we've always ignored slightly the claims, uh, and it's about what actually the experience is when we start when we start working with these tools. Is, I think that's going to be the the case. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I've talked to a number of uh, storyline developers over the last couple of weeks. Or the last week, and uh, many haven't even had a chance to to have a play with with uh, with, um, with the tools. I've only had a quick play with Rise. I, I'd say I was quite impressed. I did in fact talk to to Lucidat and Gomo about it. They were also impressed. I think it has quite limited functionality compared to those tools, uh, but but certainly it's an exciting time to be to be developing e-learning or digital learning, other protocol it these days. Good. Well, I think that's uh, pretty much us done for our ten trends. I thought it'd be a nice idea at the end, just to think about about where these things are on on, on our sort of a, on our adoption curve. 
So, so this is where I place them. Uh, we, could, we could maybe have a discussion about where they are. So, so I think things like adaptive and personalized is, is sort of something that, that we're just sort of starting to see. Uh, you know, tools and platforms aren't quite there yet. Uh, but at the other end of the scale, we have gamification. I think if you aren't doing gamification or doing some sort of game-like elements in your e-learning now, you're, you're, you're a bit behind. Uh, responsive design now, I think it's very much more popular now. We have articulate doing it as well. I think that's going to be something that I'll actually uh, uh, you know, increasingly we're going to see in 2017 much, much more responsive design. And then the other one, other things uh, uh, in, in the middle. I'm going to put you on the spot, John, with a couple of questions. Is, is LXP your, your learning experience? It is indeed, yes. Learning experience design, that's my, that's my new sort of buzz term for 2017. Okay. You think, obviously, that, that's a big area that we, you know, we look at in learning. Think it's think it's that still in the early adopter space. And my, my follow up question is, what do you think? Might be a hard one. What do you think is the other side of that curve? You know, the, the dark side of the late majority. What are what are the late majority doing? Oh, the late majority are probably still building click next modules in storyline. Um, so 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 for me, learning experience design is something that actually we we step back from, from the click next, get a score, to think well, actually what is the what is the whole learning experience like. So of course it won't, it won't apply to every every project we do and, and clearly it needs a bit more effort and work and just to think that through. Uh, so it's not something that will automatically be used for example every project I come across, I, I don't think we'll turn into magical LXPs, uh, but certainly it's something that, that, that you know, as, as a toolkit, I think it's something that it ops the game in, in, in developing digital learning. Okay. Anybody, anybody has any questions for John? If, if you want to post them, then we're going to field, field the questions now, because obviously any questions we can answer straight away, we'll, we'll do that. Um, any that we maybe need to come back to you on some things, equally we're happy to do that. So this may be the starting of a, of a conversation, but I'll, I'll field the questions and I'll, I'll throw them out to John. So we'll start with, with the first one. So John, a couple of questions. One, one's quite specific. Um, Mark, Mark's come in to say, where would you rate Oracle Taleo learned on the curve? So uh, it's quite, quite specific, Mark. So you're looking at the learning and talent management system there, Mark, I'm assuming. Uh, we've got another question. Uh, from Margaret, uh, games versus gamification is a research to show which works best in a corporate environment. Is it worth a high investment to develop a full game environment? So I'll let you maybe handle those two, John. Well, yes, uh, well, uh, well, uh, well, yes, the, well, the Oracle quest, yes, I mean, I did cringe when somebody mentioned Oracle. Um, I mean, clearly some of these, what I call corporate sort of LMS talent management systems are, are, are uh, for me as a learning, that they, they aren't necessarily the best places to deliver learning experience designs. And they're probably geared up for, for probably a, well, I'd like to maybe almost say a bygone age. Um, but however, if that's what you've got to use, then, then that's what you've got to use. And I think actually coming on to the next question, so, so, so for me, gamification, so, so whatever LMS you're using, you can fairly, in a straightforward way, gamify your, 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 your content. So, so adding, calling things like challenges, uh, um, giving uh, 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 scores, uh, points, levels, uh, having different routes through, creating a story around it are all fairly straightforward to do or work on any any LMS. Um, there, there is a lot of research that showed. I, I can't link any can't give you any off my head now, but certainly uh, the game. Look at Carl Capps' work, for example. There's a lot of research to show that game pace. And I think you know the, the fact that game pace is now embedded in a lot of things you do on the web uh, it indicates it's uh, you know what what they call this idea whole idea of choice architecture and, and behavioral economics. Uh, a lot of the, the game pace and techniques come out of that. Um, so so uh, there is a lot of research to show that, that people actually even you know even of people of all ages do benefit from some sort of game game pace approach. As far as game design goes, that's a different ball game. So, so of course, it is much more challenging, much more expensive, much more difficult to 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 to, to, to design a game. And whether the whether that investment will pay off in the end, whether there's a return on that, 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 that that's a good question. So once again, you have to think about very carefully about about, about you know how important the learning outcomes were, 
uh, before you start down the road of designing a game. I mean, I've done it a few times. It's quite challenging and quite, and quite expensive and difficult. and doesn't always work out uh, uh, with, a, with a great, great solution or, uh, in, in any event. Got, uh, two, two more questions, John. Uh, one, maybe answer a little bit. So, uh, Anne's asking whether the, the sort of death of Flash also means the death of IE, the Internet Explorer, particularly older versions. Would maybe comment that would be there. It depends a little bit on your target audience. We, we would always see a technical stack of any project to work out what browsers and others will be using it on, but increasingly users are, are using a diverse range of browsers, and typically browsers are you know, with people to update themselves if they're not in within the corporate network. So definitely move towards things that support HTML5 rather than Flash is going to be a new trend. One other question, John, that I'll, I'll um, let you answer from, from Alistair. Obviously, some of these things are really exciting. I'm going to paraphrase Alistair's questions. You know, how do you do some of these more innovative things, John, but when you've got, you got limited resources? You know, such as such as personalization is the example that, that Alistair uses. Yes, well, of course. Um, yeah, doing things on a, on a tight budget is always always challenging. But but I think if you if you consider what you know what you're what you're what you're trying to achieve, I think uh, you know it, it's it's uh, one could argue that you need to create tools and stuff to do this, but actually you don't. I mean, if you wanted to. Uh, I built some very simply learning modules in the past where at the start we asked the learner a couple of questions. Based on those questions, we give them some different content. So that's, that's an example of, 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 of personalization or adaption at a, at a sort of a, as a content, at a content level. Now, obviously, not as powerful in the long term as being at some sort of platform, but certainly you can take those sort of approaches. And again, when it comes to designing a learning experience, there is a, there is a tendency to just Run up a storyline and start creating slides. I think if you get into a room with uh, with, a, with a group of people, think about about what you want to learn is to, to to achieve using using something like action mapping. I think you can actually come up. I mean, I've I've run workshops and, and done this, and actually it's, it's it's amazing how creative people can be when when they don't think about the tool or the platform first. And I think that taking that approach, you can come up with some some really cool ideas. Uh, and then you then have to implement them in, in, in a, a most cost way, cost cost effective way as possible. So keep going with the questions in pairs, John. And you can sort of pick either both of them or one. And um, Michael asks an interesting question: If the learning gets smaller, i.e., is delivered by mobile devices, does does the actual learning get smaller? You know, because there's less less transfer. Um, maybe something more about the performance support. But let let you answer that. The other question is, I'd be interested to see the one that you took out, because Char Charles is asking, you mentioned the social and informal learning. So we've got a question, <laughs> question about social learning, we've got a question about... Well, well done, Charles. That was the one I took out. So I took out social and formal, uh, which is something that, you know, I, I, you know of course, the whole 70-20-10 uh, discussion, and uh, yeah, I have worked in, in, in social and informal learning in uh -huh, days so with, with KM. Uh, yes, uh, so that, that is the one I... I, 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 I I took that. What was the other first question, Gavin? It was really a question about you know response, responsive design, etc. Obviously, the real estate on a, on a device becomes smaller. Does the does the learning, you know, the actual learning, seem to take place get smaller as well? Yes, and that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm in some, in some ways I'm sort of against micro learning because I think you know, at the end of the day, people need time to learn stuff, uh, and clients just want to distill things into smaller and smaller things. But I think what what I think what micro learning, you know, what I'm seeing. Is coming out of the micro learning uh, uh, camp is, is that we do we just break our things into smaller chunks and then, and then provide those chunks in, in, in some sort of pathway and once again as I said earlier that we can then adapt that pathway so if you think you know something you can jump straight to that uh, you can skip things you can combine things in different ways so for me I think that's the big advantage of micro learning so so you can maybe quickly look something up on the phone if you need it at a time. But then later on, you can go back and do the rest of the of, of the whole sort of learning pathway. But ultimately, of course, you need to do all of those things probably to take to take yourself to the same place. And, and if you've done a done a, done a more conventional looking uh, e learning course. One more from Julie. Um, Julie asks, best modern HLMS for for LXP learning experiences. Cool. You know, that sort of campaign. Oh, that is a. That that is a that is a challenge. Um, 
I don't know, could it go on? No, not Oracle. Uh, <laughs> no. um, yes, I mean, there, there are some, I mean, some of the modern LMSs like, uh, like uh, LearnUpon or Talent LMS, uh, Litmos, some of those are sort of have more of these features built in. They probably don't get the whole learning experience design thing, uh, but certainly they've got gamification and, and probably nice ways to, to create learning pathways, so they probably pick the micro-learning box. Um, learning experience design is a bit more challenging. I think probably the best learning experience designs I've seen have um, largely they've developed a uh, bespoke mini LMS to sort of, um, for example, that, that example I showed you from Toyota, um, that, that screen uh, was actually a, a very light LMS. Uh, that link all the learning activities together to provide a coherent look and feel. Because that's one of the key things I think about learning experience design is, is that you want a coherent look. So it's all very well for us to orient to design wonderfully looking new learning modules, but then you have to navigate 15 screens in Oracle and on the Oracle LMS to get at them. It sort of destroys the experience, whereas you have the ability to create uh, uh, something that, that looks good right from the get go. I think that, that, that's really important for, for a learning, learning experience design. Uh, I think of a recent recent project we did with the government agency, John, where, where actually they came to us looking for a learning management system. Uh, and through talking to them, we realized actually the learning management system is going to get in the way of your learning. So we created some custom HTML5 pages, presented a little learning model on screen, and people were, were able to get straight to that. Um, are there any, any other questions? Take one or two. If you there. Uh, if there are any other questions you want to post, we'll take, take a couple more. Uh, beyond that, we will make the slides available to the people from today. Uh, as good learning practitioners, we will reflect on the, on the audio issues we had at the start. So I think I think most people that have been approved for it, there's maybe a couple of apologies or two. But certainly, if there's, there's any, any questions, you can either post them now or we will. We will uh, happy to, to be emailed. My email address is uh, gavin.woods at orionlearning.com. I'm more than happy. And you can see how different ways you can, you can get in touch uh, with us. Um, a few people saying thank you to, to you, John. Very, very insightful. Uh, appreciate everybody taking the time. I'm very much happy to continue continue dialogue uh, following this. Um, so hopefully, hopefully. 2017 fills you with excitement rather than dread. I know it's with somebody uh, just yesterday has to build 25 modules just themselves. So sometimes it can be difficult to find ideas just to keep that uh, keep that enthusiasm going. But definitely, definitely some of these things we would have seen last year are, are developing a little bit more. And maybe uh, maybe leave you with John's final final thoughts. Yeah. So I'm I'm always a bit sort of you know a bit. Uh, um, reluctant when it comes to to um, I think you know in the industry we, we can be sort of a bit oh here's a shiny new toy everybody should be using it of course uh, that's not the way the way the world when I go and meet clients most of them are still using Storyline they're only just getting started so so um, so you know, by no means uh, and by no means do I expect people to use all of these things at once but I think you know what's useful about doing these sessions is gives you a little insight in, 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 into what what is being done what can be done. And maybe just have, I mean, even if you pick up one idea from one of these links uh, to improve your learning design, I think that's a, that's a step in the right in the right direction. And I think who was it said? You know, we, we get to places by making small steps, not giant leaps. So, so if any of you, you know, use a wonderful AR or VR learning experience next year, please send us a link. Um, but but I think that, you know, hopefully there's enough here for you to think about and maybe to try and put in, in practice at some point. Okay, so on that, on that positive note, uh, we'll, we'll leave you to get, get back to your day job, um, and hopefully we'll speak again soon. Absolutely.